I wrote this thing. I hope you like it. Let's talk about it, yeah. Let's lose track. Losing the plot podcast. Losing the plot podcast. Losing the plot podcast. Talking to Leo and. Hello everyone, and welcome to this, the very first episode of Losing the Plot that I am producing exclusively for Ephotic Realm. If you're new to the show, uh, my name is Leo Robertson, and I find uh, people that I think would be interesting to talk to, they're often artists, they're often more specifically writers. Uh, I talk to them about their work, I talk to them about life, we talk about anything and everything together. We lose the plot together, hence the title of the show. So I've been making this podcast for about two years now. I got to about 60 plus episodes. I took a little break because I was moving uh, apartments. And during that time, uh, the wonderful people at Ephotic Realm got in touch and said that they wanted to sponsor the show. So essentially, they will host all the episodes. And all I have to do is tell you a little bit about what Ephotic Realm has been up to recently, which is something I probably would have done anyway, uh, because I think that they're doing great work. So with that said, why don't I tell you what's been going on at Ephotic Realm recently? Well, first of all, submissions are now open for issue seven. Uh, the theme is gruesome. Who doesn't love over the top 80s horror films? A punk band fights off a horde of possessed fans at a local concert. A makeout session at the cemetery takes a turn for the worst. Slashers, critters, demons, gore, hairspray. We want the 80s horror B movie aesthetic. Uh, Submission is opened March 1st. They close June 1st. Uh, they're looking for stories from 1,000 to 5,000 words. And the theme, once again, is gruesome. Of course, if you're going to submit to a magazine, it's always a good idea to read an issue first. It's always a good idea to read an issue of Aphotic Realm anyway. Uh, the latest one is Issue number six, that's fangs. Uh, rabid wolves terrorize the villagers. Swarms of relentless rats overwhelm the populace. Aphotic Realm, home of the strange and sinister, brings you fangs, a collection of animal horror stories about rabid wolves, relentless rats, and other terrifying creatures. 64 full color pages for your reading pleasure. That's eight stories, an interview, comic, artist showcase, and a non-fiction article. The interview, by the way, is with Adam Neville, who is author of The Ritual and many other wonderful books. Uh, the Ritual, you may recall, was a film on Netflix recently, so do um, check out that interview, check out issue number six, that's Fangs, and consider submitting for issue number seven, Gruesome. Open for submissions now. Okay, and now on to this episode's guest. That's Jack C.J. Stark. He is the author of the short story collection Unsound Sounds, now available from Smashwords. Link in the description for that. Uh, he is uh, someone that I've been in touch with, uh, you know, he was a book blogger with his blog Random Melon Reads, he's taking a hi hiatus from that, might come back later, who knows, uh, we talk about that. We talk about his writing, we talk about his life, we do a great Losing the Plot episode together. And one of the reasons for that is because Jack himself was a fan of the show and he'd listened to every single episode. So he knew exactly the format and this is a prime Losing the Plot episode for you if you are new to the show and you've discovered it through Aphotic Realm. This is what I do and uh, this is a great guest, a guy that I, I hope you'll check out his work and I hope you enjoy our chat. One final thing, if you want to get in touch with me for anything associated with the podcast, uh, you might want to be a guest yourself, you might want to suggest a guest, you want to give me some feedback. Uh, whatever reason you may have for getting in touch with me, you can always do so using losingtheplotpodcast at gmail.com and I look forward to hearing from you. But that is all my intro spiel for now. So let's get to my interview with Jack C.J. Stark. Um, let's talk about uh, indie authors because you're like big in the indie scene in terms of reviewing people that you find by yourself and everything. What is it that attracts you about 
uh, the indie scene in particular. So was that just in the first, Leo? No, it's not that formal. You're not supposed to notice the format. That was question the first, wasn't it? No. No. Question the first. No, I'm an expert interviewer. You didn't notice that. That was definitely question the first. I mm. like question the first. It was a good question. Good opening question. I'm glad you've asked it. Okay. Um, I feel like it really links in with who I am as a person. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I um, I do like indie authors. I like indie stories. I like reading indie stories. Um, I, oh, oh, I'm going to sound really pretentious. Hmm, that's okay. Mm-hmm. I, um, I tend not to like stories that are all the same. And I find reading stories from some of the big publishing companies, shall we say, mm-hmm. um, tend to follow a bit of a structure and a pattern. And um, they become a bit too predictable for me. So I, I decided I didn't want to read those sort of things. So I started trying to seek out some indie authors um, to review on the... Um, the book blog that I used to have called Random Melon Reads. It's no longer live, but it's still there. You can still go and read some of the reviews that are on there. Mm-hmm. And I uh, started seeking out some indie authors, yeah, through Goodreads. And then, uh, you know, you find one and then you find another and then you find another. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, and now I mainly just read indie stuff. Cool. Um, I, I think I have to agree. Um... And in particular, I found, like, recently, the more a book is, like, the thing you have to read this summer, even if it's lauded for its literary merit, is still not very good. It's yep. kind of... It's, it's, like, it's had the edges filed off it, or something. Um, yeah, I, I don't know... I mean, obviously, I'm not published uh, through any sort of big... Well, I'm not published through any publishing press, full stop, but... I just get the feeling like maybe there's a few too many hands in the pot around um, creating a story that will sell um, Mm. with some of the bigger publishing houses. And I just think when you go to indie publishers or self-published authors, you can get a bit more of a connection to what it is those those authors were trying to say with their story. It just feels a bit more um, true to them, really. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I th- yeah, I think it's like um, it's yeah, it's closer to the source of the creative impulse before it's been so heavily polished that you. Mm. I I think especially, um, what I like about your writing and what I like about a lot of writing in general is how personal it is, um, and I think that that's one style of, it's one of the ways in which stories can be not. Uh, broad enough for a big audience is that they're too specific to one particular person. It has to be mm-hmm. diluted down so that it can be relatable to more people. But I think in the doing of that, you lose what the person was going for. Yeah, I think I feel like I'm shitting on big authors um, and, and big publishing houses, and I'm I'm not because <clears throat> I think there's a place for that. Um, I think you know it, it's not like you have to have one or the other. Um, there's enough space to have both um, and I think um, you know big publishing houses are not in any danger at the moment um, And but that doesn't mean that we can't have this other side of things which is uh, self-published or indie published where people can um, tell the stories that they wanted to tell without having to feel like they have to water it down or feel like they have to um, you know, take out certain bits because you're not just put, you're not just representing yourself as the author. You're representing the the publishers as well, and some of those big publishers are trying to think about their public image and things like that. So, then um, yeah, it, it works for some stories, but it just doesn't work for me as a reader first and foremost. Um, and I'm not sure if it would work for me as a as a as a writer either. Hmm. Not at least with uh, you know what I see from this first collection. Um, it seems like you're going, I mean, I like especially, and even with the stuff you've been posting on your blog, that you, uh, you're you sometimes very experimental in the form that you go for. Yeah, um, am I? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I'm I, the one I read recently was the the sci-fi story that takes place like an instant message chat. Oh, I lost sense. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. there there's that, and also I've got the applicant here as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's quite a unique style as well. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah, I have a fond connection to the applicant. It was a bit of a silly story that I wrote um, for um, no other purpose really than to entertain myself with it. Um, <laughs> I'd written a story that was a bit heavy, you know, subject-wise, and um, and I just felt, oh, I need something that's a bit silly and a bit nonsensical. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the applicant. Uh, it's pretty much just a copy of an application form that I once read when I was doing some interviews. Um, <laughs> and you you come across, you know, yeah, well, we know what the uh, the the situation is like. Um, at the moment where there just aren't enough jobs so you've got loads of people who are just being forced to apply for jobs through the job center mm -hmm. and you can pick out the application forms from people who are genuinely interested in the job and the application forms that are just you know the job centers told them to send 50 applications today right um, and sometimes some of those 50 applications that they've had to send out uh, some of those are quite comical and a bit funny mm -hmm. um, and um on the surface of things, they're comical and funny because they're terrible, they're poor, poorly written, and um, they often have very little connection to the job that they're actually applying for because they're just using a bit of a, a carbon copy of a, a standard that they, they've come up with. Um, so on the surface, they're, they're a bit funny and a bit comical. When you sort of look into them a little bit deeper, they're d desperately tragic and sad that these people are in that situation and... Um, clearly aren't getting the help and support they need to write something proper. Mm. Um, so I set off writing the applicant with this mindset that it, it will just be funny, it'll be a bit of silliness, um, and then try to also sort of subtly put that message in there. But whether I did or didn't is, is for other people to judge. Um, but that's what I tried to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it seems... Uh... I think maybe just in the context of the rest of the collection, it is kind of all about, at least to me, it seems to be about disconnectedness, not like, mm -hmm. like you say, not getting the help you need and just not being, not being right for the part of wherever it is you're doing, whether it's just like being a human or applying for a job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's for sort of why uh, I titled it Unsound Sounds, really. Um, it's because it's that, that idea that, um, you know, there's stuff happening in the stories, but really the deeper message with all of them is about how um, people find themselves in certain situations or um, find themselves going through things that they wouldn't necessarily have chosen to do, but they're there because they just don't fit into the mold of, of you know, this is what it means to be in society, this is what it means to um, to succeed, is, you know, you, you have this, this thing and that thing and you have a job or you, or you leave school, you go to college, you get a job and you get married and you might have a kid and then you have a house or whatever, you know, and, and as long as you're doing all those things, then you, you're you sort of succeeding in society. Mm. And I feel like uh, um, that works for some people. And I think that's wonderful when it does work for them. But I think um, it doesn't work for a lot of people. Um, and those are the people that we sort of look at and just say, um, we had a look at them with pity. Or we just um, we just ignore them because they're not part of our society or they're not part of who we are. Um, and I think most of my writing up to now has been around trying to explore that, trying to find um, these characters that sort of just don't fit, but desperately want to fit, mm -hmm. but don't necessarily want to fit into that standard mould. Who want something different to be able to fit into. And I mean, I would guess it's something that. Uh that more people struggle with than it seems. Yeah, I think I think even those people who look like they're appearing to to be fine in society and got everything together, you know, most people are just making it all busy go along. And um, and I think we can all possibly look at some of our aspects of our own lives and just say, oh well I'm not doing as well here that then I wanted to and I'm not doing as well there. Um, and even if you have got those things, or even if you did leave school and go to college and then uni and got a job and married and kids in a house and whatever, you know, and a pet dog and 
you know, you've got nice carpets and pictures on the walls and shit like that. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you like to look at some other aspects of your life and say, well, I didn't achieve this thing or I didn't achieve that thing. Um, and I, I suppose what I enjoy trying to, to explore is, is why do we have those desires? What is it that we're really trying to achieve and, and succeed in? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, is it something that's just fed to us through society? Is it is it something that we, we feed on because we look at other people around us and decide that we must have those things? Or is it that we feel like that is our true selves and that's what we're trying to achieve? Um, I don't think there's any proper answers to it, really. I think, um, you know, nobody's come up with a proper answer to it so far. Yeah, I, I think like you say, the the standard model of how to be happy is is perhaps standard because it does work for most people but i think that um if it doesn't then you know d- depending on the type of culture or society you're in you very quickly start to feel you know wrong yeah i think it's that, um it, <laughs> yeah it's, yeah, you're absolutely right with that phrase of, you know, you start to feel wrong. You start to feel like, well, what am I not getting or what am I not achieving here? Um, mm. and, and, and what if I could just... I think for myself and, and a lot of the stories that I write, I try it. There's, there's this underlying message of people who, um, you know, are, are trying to find their way, really. Um, and that's so difficult to do when you haven't got a lot of examples of that so you can look at it and say well you know having a having all that stuff that i mentioned all that, all that materialistic stuff um it doesn't work for me and if that doesn't work for me then what will work for me and some people are able to find that but i think a lot of people are not able to find that because um it's not so easy to see and and we're brought up through in a in a culture and in society where um you know we are taught this one thing over here um, and you don't see as much of these alternative paths you don't see this so you know mm-hmm. these alternative ways to find happiness or find who you are um, so when you're not automatically achieving or not automatically attracted to that standard model it's very easy to start feeling like you you've um, you know you just don't fit or you're losing or that you failed at trying to be a person and um, and I don't believe that's that is the case, because um, I think people will find whatever works for them, hopefully. Um, but I think sometimes that's a bit more of a difficult journey for some than others. Oh yeah, no, I think I think that's very true, and I like that you point out um, the idea of having role models. Uh, mm. It's. Yeah, it, it just seems, um, and and I'm, I'll let you comment as well on social media because I'm sure you have your own opinion of it, which I've seen through your writing. But I think it does it does uh, flatten and standardize even further the the type of life that you're supposed to have. Um, and I think, like on top of that, uh, this is I mean this is just what I'm guessing. But having seen certain people that I know and thinking about like the the way that they grew up and the way that their parents reacted to them. I think that it's, I don't know too much about the psychology, but I'm pretty sure that that's the kind of thing that you seek out again and again, um, out of just its familiarity, not, not, not really in a sense that it's not even in a sense that it's the right thing for you, just that it, it takes on the shape of something that you recognize. Um, I I think you're absolutely right. Um, And I think, um, you know, there's so many different ways that we can look into that, whether we're, we're looking at people's career prospects, whether we're looking at, at people's careers aspirations, I suppose is the correct word, um, mm. whether we look at people's sexuality, whether we look at, you know, just there's so much really, people's gender and stuff, you know, it's that you want this thing um, or you're told that you are going to want this thing growing up. Um, you're told that you're a boy or a girl. You're told that you like boys or girls and that you have these attractions to these people. And then you get older and you start to be told that, well, this is a successful job or this is a good career or whatever, you know, this is a good course to go and do at university. And then that works for some people. And I think if, if, if they're happy doing that, then genuinely wonderful. I think that's great. Um, but I think 
when you don't fit that, <laughs> when you sort of look at it, you think, like personally myself, I'm mm-hmm. asexual. I think we've been recording or we've been chatting for about 20 minutes now. It mm-hmm. only took 20 minutes for me to bring up my sexuality. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but growing up, you know, you're told that, oh, well, you know, I was friends with girls growing up and there was so many comments about them then being my girlfriend and I never had that desire or that attraction. Um, but in my teenage years, I did have girlfriends and they had a boyfriend. And But it was all really about just trying to explore it wasn't because of a desire that I had. It was about trying to explore this standard that society had told me that I had to achieve or that this model that I had to fit into. Um, and I think, you know, it was only when I got out of my teenage years or, or towards the end of my teenage years did I suddenly realise that just doesn't work for me and that it felt all very fake for me. Um, and so, you know, but I think the same thing could be said about career aspects and stuff like that. I was relatively studious in school and I did relatively okay in school. So it was just automatically assumed that I would go to college and then university and stuff like that. And um, When I left school, I decided, no, I'm not going to do that because it just didn't feel right to me. So I just didn't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think th- there's some freedom in that and there's some, some aspects of, well, I'm just going to stay true to myself, which can be... Um, you know, you can find a lot of joy in that. <laughs> but mm-hmm. the problem comes when if being true to yourself means you don't fit this particular mould and then there is nothing else for you to fit into or you don't know how to fit into anything else or you're not quite sure, you know, well, if I'm not that, then what am I? Mm-hmm. And if you're not seeing anything around you that you can relate to and say, oh, well, I think I'm that or I think I'm this or I'm, I'm a bit of this or a bit of that. Mm-hmm. And um, it's very easy to become very lost and just feel like... You, you just um, you just not succeeding as a person. Um, so you know. Anyway, that's getting uh, it's getting very um, sad there, isn't it? Shall we? Um, d- d- hey, Leo, uh-huh. did you don't you want to cut this, Leo? Did you? Uh, I, I I bought an antique the other day. Oh, um, did you? I did. It, it's a pencil, mm-hmm. um, and it belonged to William Shakespeare. Definitely dead. Don't, okay. don't question it. Okay. Um, but it, he chewed the end of the pencil, so it's difficult to see if it's to be or not. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> it's the father. <laughs> oh, dear God. <laughs> oh, well, I think the connection went a bit fuzzy there, so I don't think it's <laughs> fine. I'll leave it in. I'm kidding. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's cool. It's fine. Don't you... worry, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> is this just so that I feel as nervous as you do? <laughs> <laughs> you you did bring it up, and it did only take you twenty minutes. But I was going to ask yeah. you about it. Um, you, I I imagine it must be really confusing to come out as asexual because but you're. I I want you to explain it to me, of course, but it seems like it it it's I mean it's in the name it's it's not a sexuality it's a lack thereof. Um, yeah, it's it's a really difficult one, um, and I feel like um, it's not something that's very easy to to define really. Um, in that it, it's so open ended, and there's so many different various. Um, sort of aspects of asexuality. You know, I can speak to 10 different asexual people and we all experience it very differently from one another. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to say. Um, I think, essentially, being um, anything than heterosexual can be, um, can be difficult for some people. Um, I don't think it's difficult for everyone, but I think, uh, you know, at some point you're going to go... I think most people at some point are probably going to have to go against the standard of what they've been told growing up. Um, or I definitely experienced that. Um, and for a long time, I was confused about my sexuality because I didn't know what it was. I didn't know about asexuality. I didn't know it existed. Um, for a long time, um, I identified as bisexual and just said that I hadn't found the right person because... I didn't really like girls. I didn't really like boys either. Um, 
and, and so it was a bit like, well, I must be bisexual and just be a bit picky about things. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, and I would just tell people that when people asked, I would just say, oh, no, that's not for me, um, and try and leave it at that. And then it was only really through social media, one of the few good things that has come out of social media mm-hmm. <laughs> is this uh, sort of recognition that that this is a thing that other people experience it um, that we call it asexuality um, and that you know it, it is all common I think um, but it's it's not long in any way or different in, in, in that sense um, you know it's just um, yeah it's a difficult one to explain it's a difficult one to really sort of pin down because i feel like i want to talk on behalf of all asexuals mm. um, but then i desperately don't want to talk on behalf of all asexuals because uh, like i said you know we all experience it so very differently from one another yeah no i i i totally understand i don't i i don't um ask about your experience as, as if understanding as if you are talking about an entire group i i you know um i think like you touch upon the idea that even heterosexuals will have to go against the grain in terms of sexual preference because it's all it's all unique in its own way which i think is an interesting point um you look at like i only like i only realized this recently even but when you look at the standard kind of body type that is presented um there was that big controversy about are you beach body ready in the uk and there were two different very athletic people trying to make everyone feel bad that they didn't look like them and not only not only does such a tiny proportion of the population look like that but it's I, I would doubt it's even what it might be what most people are attracted to but it's not what everyone is attracted to um so it's yeah, it, it's you know. a very difficult one for me it fascinates me sexuality as a whole fascinates me because it's it feels so alien to me so i can look at a body of i can look at someone mm-hmm. and say they are probably what most people would consider sexually attractive people. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, there's a lot of confliction within my own mind about, well, is that because that's what I've experienced, where a lot of people are sexually attracted to that kind of person? Or is it that the media has told me that's what is sexually attractive? Um, because I can't feel sexually attracted to those people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know what what is attractive and what isn't attractive because it's such an alien concept to me which is what makes it so immensely fascinating because I think a lot of people do a lot of stupid things when it comes to um, you know for the sake of sex Mm -hmm. Um, and I think yeah it fascinates me because it's so alien because I just I can't really seem to connect with it in that sense but I've always been relatively comfortable with my sexuality Mm -hmm. Uh, you know not overly comfortable with myself as a person but in regards to my sexuality once I got over that fact of you know thinking oh well I must try and find a boyfriend or a girlfriend or I must try and experience this because I might like it if I try it um, and then once I got over that and decided that actually no this just isn't for me and so I'm not going to carry on trying to pursue that I'm not going to keep um, doing these things that I don't like to try and um, sort of please um, the expectations of everyone else then uh, then I became very comfortable with it and, and um, that's why I have it you know I have the, the asexual flag on my Twitter profile and, and I, I say that I'm, I'm at AOIs and um I try and talk openly about it because I don't think a lot of people know about sexuality, um, mm-hmm. in asexuality, sorry. Um, and I think, yeah, people find it fascinating. It's, uh, I find it fascinating. Mm. Uh, I imagine this is a difficult question for you to answer even, but how does a lack well, of... Ask, um... <laughs> you, you're not going to answer it then? All right. <laughs> not, well, <laughs> no, but if if you're not, because I I don't even know the answer to this in terms of me. But if you're not attracted to other people, how does it how does it influence your own self image? Um, yeah, I think um, I think probably still feel a lot of um, 
what other people feel because I think so much of our own self-image is, is defined by sort of society and media and what we see on TV or, or what we see on social media and such like that. So but I'm a big wrestling nerd um, mm -hmm. and, you know, growing up, I was a bit like, oh, right, I must have a body like The Rock then because that's, <laughs> that's what's socially acceptable. And, of course, nobody's got a body like The Rock apart from The Rock. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I did go to the gym as a teenager and was like, right, yes, I must, you look at my biceps, yeah, wonderful. Um, but that was always more of a, if I have these things, then um, I will be more accepted into society. It was never about, oh, yeah, look at my big biceps, therefore this woman's going to want to have sex with me or this guy's going to want to have sex with me because mm -hmm. um, that was never the, the, the goal, really. Um, but I think it, it's, it is a difficult one to, to answer, really, but I do think we probably still have the same sort of image of ourselves and who we are, and, and not just physical image, but, you know, image of, of who we are, as a person on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, so we, yeah. and, and I think so much of that is defined by what we are told is success as we've, you know, growing up. And so I think, mm -hmm. I think we still feel that because although I'm not sexually attracted to people, I've got no desire to, to have a, any sort of sexual or any romantic relationships with people full stop. I still want to be accepted by people. I still want to have friends. I still want to be included in groups. I still want to, you know, survive in a, in a society and, and integrate with a community of people. So there's still all of those desires. Um, and I think so much of it is probably linked with with sexuality in, in, in one respect, you know. Um, we, we try and look at why are we sexual beings? Well, some of us aren't, but, you know, as a whole, mm -hmm. <laughs> why are we sexual beings? It is it is for survival, and it's, it, it, it helps with the integration of us into a community and into society. Mm. So all that's still there. Um, you know, I still want people to look at me and think I look like a normal person. I still care about the image that I present to people, and the physical image and, and also the the um, sort of intellectual image but I think um, you know it probably stops at the point of um, I want that person to be impressed but I don't ever want them to touch me in any way whatsoever hmm. um, as every gay man uh, I, I know <laughs> I have like some uh, some understanding of it as well I think that it, you you tune it out as background noise, but I think if anyone ever, uh, every now and then you get clued into just how much people have, it, it's confusing for the mainstream as well, because I don't think they really understand how much of what they do is tied into their own sexuality because it's just default. So it's not Absolutely. like, it's not like they have something to compare it to. So I think like, I mean, for example, when you meet certain straight men and, and they, they're, they have a, a kind of morbid fascination, I would say with with the way you live your life because they they imagine it's so it has to be so incredibly different from theirs because <laughs> they they've got it in their head that there's something so incredibly heterosexual about them but if you actually uh if you actually i don't know tallied up how many things you did that you did in a heterosexual manner you would find that sexuality is has been made to be a bigger part of life than it should and it, it's confusing yeah. everyone yeah, it's, um, I think, I mean, obviously you wake up on, on a bed of rainbows, that's a <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people sleep, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and, and you wake up in the morning and, and announce that you're gay, mm -hmm. um, and then you get on with your day. I do my gaily um, prayers. <laughs> exactly, yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you get your gay stamps for the day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think there is this, this sense of, so much is told to us um, almost through um, a collective subconscious, really, of, uh, of people. And I think exactly you're right in what you're saying, that I think a lot of it, I think with, with Twitter and social media and these social justice warriors and stuff like that, it, it, there's this easy... Um, I think sometimes people fall into this trap easily of thinking well this person did this thing and that's harmful or it's oppressive or it's exclusive 
Mm. And therefore, they're doing that with the knowledge that it's harmful and oppressive and exclusive, and that makes them a shit person, so now we must all hate them. Mm. And I think there are, there are some people like that out there, but I think a lot of it is just done in ignorance, really. Um, and I think, you know, I think we all make judgments and we all have prejudices. Um, and, and there is a, a morbid fascination with people who are different to us. Um, you know, as, as an asexual person, I, I do look at people who, like I said before, do, do stupid things for the sake of love, mm. or, you know, because, um, and I look at that with such fascination, thinking, oh, wow, this this um, this thing that they're feeling, this attraction to someone else, it must be so all-consuming and all-powerful that they go and do these ridiculous things that they just wouldn't do if they weren't crushing or, you know, they weren't in love or whatever it is. Mm. Um, so I think there's fascination on, on both sides, really. I think the big problem we've got is we just don't speak about it enough um, and people are too afraid to ask a question or they're too afraid to insult somebody. Um, and I think that there is an issue with people being a bit overly sensitive, shall we say. Um, maybe I don't want to judge other people, but you know, I think sometimes we can create an environment where we stop people from asking the questions they need to ask because they're too afraid of saying the wrong thing or insulting somebody or being, you know, accidentally homophobic or racist or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if, if we just allowed each other to be able to say, okay, so you're gay or you're asexual or you're black or you're from this country I don't know about, and therefore I don't know about this, it's different to me it, it is weird to me but that doesn't make you a weird person mm. but the concept is weird to me um i think then we'd be able to have a lot more open conversations about it and hopefully understand each other a bit more and, and create more unity i agree and i think but i th i i i believe you know that it's happening in a on a one-on-one -on -one basis i don't think the internet is the place for it because once it becomes public you know it <laughs> It, it is subject to that outrage culture thing that you're you're referring to mm. uh, i um i'm I, I don't know what it is that interests me about the people i want to talk to on this podcast or rather whatever it is it's it's something unique to that person it's not like i'm interviewing you because you're asexual but it's not like i i mm. but I, it's definitely something i wanted to talk to you about but i know that you're there's more to you than that um but it, it, I, I don't know that there are a lot of interesting things about me <laughs> yeah sure i mean i'm 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 really excited for the next joke though um I, I'll, I'll finish this train of thought first um sure. i mean er, er, you know this diversity conversation is one of many different in, in, interesting conversations going on i don't know if every single thing needs to be evaluated based on its diversity <laughs> but i've tried to talk to um it, like transgender people and and other minorities on this podcast but what you find is that they self-reject more than other groups so you don't get the chance to talk to them because i think that they are scared of the kind of questions you're asking right you know perhaps rightly so because they don't know who you are but it, it it's i don't know how that's ever going to go away i don't know how that um yeah, yeah i think i think what happens uh, and again i don't want to talk to everyone else but i think you know if you're not, well, maybe here in England, it might be different in different places, but here in the UK, and I think it's the same in a lot of the Western world, if you're not a straight white man, mm. then you are seen as being a little bit different. Um, and I think you probably, if you're transgender or if you're a member of the LGBT community in any way, mm. or if you're not white, or if you come from a country with different customs and beliefs, you know, if you're not a Christian or, or if you don't follow one of the Abrahamic religions and you follow these, these a different religion that people don't know about. And you probably have had to grow up defending who you are a lot. And I think that makes people very cynical. Uh, and I think mm. that's probably why they're afraid to, to talk about it, because they're afraid of, oh, is this just going to be another guy who's getting it all wrong and I'm going to have to correct with everything and so on and so forth. Um, but I don't, <laughs> there, there is a sense of me that feels like, although I don't think we have to make everything about 
our diversity. I, I completely agree with you on that. I think that sometimes there's a little bit of, um, you know, people do end up representing a whole class of people. Mm. Um, and I think that's somewhat dangerous because I do know of some asexual people and I think, well, they're very, very different people to me with very different beliefs and morals and ethics. Mm. Um, and I think that, that goes for any sort of class of diversity. You know, if you want to put people in these different boxes, you're never going to get people who all think the same way because they're gay or people who all think the same way because they're black or whatever, you know. Mm. Um, so I think there is an aspect of it is our duty to speak about that. It is our duty to show that although we've got these little differences in life, that sometimes feel massive because of the way the media portrays them, but there's these differences in lives. But actually, at the root cause of it, at the root of everything, we're more alike than we are different. Um, you know, I think mm. as people, essentially, we want roughly the same things, and um, we're just sometimes going about it in different ways. Uh, I totally agree. I'm ready for another joke. <laughs> okay, cool. So, this is totally off the top of my head and not prepared in any way whatsoever. Okay. Uh, I just, I just, I was thinking the other day, I want me to buy someone a present. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, oh, uh, it's the best present to give to someone. And then I realised it, it's a broken drum because mm -hmm. it can't beat it. <laughs> Oh dear. Next question. <laughs> oh dear, I think I need a, I need a moment to recover. <laughs> I'm going to just take that one. That, that landed. <laughs> Come on. You should, uh, yeah, I think you should start with that one on your next, your next interview tour. Um, so this is definitely something you should write about, right? Like, what what would an asexual story look like or a story from an asexual perspective do you or do you find that even in this collection that you have out that there is something in there that relates to that aspect of yourself hmm, that's an interesting one um i have tried to write asexual stories within the aspect of you know this is i'm setting off with this idea that i'm going to educate people on what it's like to be asexual hmm. but the thing I find so difficult with that is, is um, I just end up writing a biography of my own story. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and I'm a pretty boring person, so it, it ends up being a good story. But um, it's not really what I want to do. Um, I think in On Sound Sounds, there, is, uh, there are two stories, um, Creases and um, a story called I Suspect It Is Here For Me, mm -hmm. which is a terrible title. I wish I'd come up with something better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's, it's called that now, so it's done. I'm living with it. It's fine, it's fine, I'm fine, everything's fine. I've accepted <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> but the, the main character in there is, is the same main character in both stories. Um, and um, that character is, they're not me. But they are very heavily based on me. They, they are a fictionalised version of me. They do things and say things and think things that I possibly wouldn't do in those situations. But um, sort of at their core, they are based on me. So therefore, they are an asexual character. Um, mm. But I don't think their sexuality comes up in either of those stories. It's been a while since I've read them. Um, but I am in the process of writing the third chapter to that story um, with the same character mm -hmm. and um, the, the sexuality does come up in that and I try not to make it a focus of who they are because you know essentially that you know an asexual person I'm just a person just like you lot mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I just like to eat pizza and watch Netflix just like you lot <laughs> so I've, I've tried really to explore another aspect of their life which is about living with mental health and, and the effects of mental health, whilst also just trying to sort of slip in that they're asexual. Um, mm. Yeah, one day I might be able to write a story that is that achieves what I set out to do, which is to talk about what it's like to be asexual. Um, but I haven't found it yet, but maybe it'll be there somewhere in the future. Hmm. So we'll probably need another joke at the end of this segment. Um, okay. <laughs> but can we talk about mental health? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did. I kind of suspected that these characters were, you know, I, I'm glad you say that you're not exactly them because I think that it's quite, you know, they're pretty bleak stories, perhaps. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I imagine then that you yourself have had mental health struggles. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, yeah, for a long time. Um, I, I had a first episode of sort of severe depression when I was eight years old. Wow. Um, and then I've had other episodes of depression through my teenage years. And then um, when I was about 23, 24 ish, I think mm. I'm about 32 now, but don't quote me on that. Mm. I don't know. I'm around that age. Um, but when I was 23, 24 ish, I, I felt depressed then and never really got out of the depression from there. Mm. And so from that age, I've been living with depression and trying to manage it on an ongoing basis. I think you're you're absolutely right in that they are bleak stories. It all sounds sounds. I promise you, I will come. I will at some point write a happy story. <laughs> <laughs> there is a half written story of mine that uh, that is trying not to be sad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling a bit. Um, but yeah, I think part of the reason why I I got back into trying to write stories was to just try and explore what was happening with me as a person in, in my life in that. Um, yeah, the depression was becoming much more difficult to manage. Um, there was other things going on for me at the time, and um, I just found that I didn't really have anyone I could talk to about it properly. Um, or every time I talked to someone, I felt like they got the wrong end of the story, and I just felt, well, then write the story. You know, write the story as to what I want to say and how I want to say it. Mm. Um, and initially, I had these grand ideas that I was going to write this 700-page novel Mm. Um, that would say everything there is to say about mental health and I'd get it all absolutely spot on of course because I'm an expert <laughs> and, then, um, and then if it all be said society would accept it and all the problems when it comes to living with mental health and the way we treat mentally ill people and so on and so forth would all be fixed um, I'd make a billion pounds and then I could sort of retire happy <laughs> and, um, and that didn't happen surprise surprise <laughs> 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 So instead, I decided that uh, short stories were the way to go, or short little poems, or just, I'm not sure if you could call them poems, but they're really just thoughts that I throw out there. Mm. Um, some of them are a lot more personal than, than other things. Um, so th there's a couple of stories in um, Unsound Sounds. One of them's called Unsound Sound, um, and the other is called 32. Um they are very personal, they are very connected to me, and they are essentially me saying the things that I don't feel like I've been able to say. And I, I, I sort of battled a lot with whether I wanted to publish those and put them out there, and whether I wanted to include them into one sound sounds or not. Um, but on my laptop, there's a whole different bunch of versions of one sound sound, as I'm sure there is for every writer who's published anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the, they're in one draft, they're out of the next one, they're in the next, and they're out of the next one. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that the, the draft that, or the version that I ended up publishing um, included them. Um, yeah, and then and then I tried to also explore what it's like. Um, I think creases is, is, is probably my best work with that with trying to get down to what it's actually like to live with the mental health illness. Um, I, I think the story I'm writing at the moment does a better job of, of talking about um, the way other people treat people with mental health illnesses. Um, but that, um, it's not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a lot of work that's not been done to it. But yeah, I think, I think it, it's difficult not to explore that that subject when um, when it becomes so all consuming as part of your life and as part of who you are. Um, I think there's this easy aspect sometimes you hear from people who are not mentally ill or haven't suffered or haven't experienced it um, closely where they just sort of think, well, you allow your mental health to, to become who you are. You know, it's almost as though, hi, I'm CJ and I'm, I'm depressed sort of thing. Mm. Um, and that you walk around with it printed on a t-shirt all day but I think that happens I think it's almost a privilege to be in a position to say well just don't let your mental health become who you are um, and I think it would be nice if it was that easy but for some people 
it, it does become who we are. You know, like, like I said, I, I suffered with bouts of depression for a long time and then it hit when I was 23, 24. It didn't go away. So it is a, a huge part of who I am. Um, it's a huge part of, of what makes me me as a person. Mm. Um, and, and writing and, and the stories that I published in Unsound Sounds was me trying to explore that really partly for myself partly as an educational tool for some other people partly as i would say an entertaining story maybe entertaining isn't the right word <laughs> but an engaging story hopefully mm. um and a way of sort of saying you know this isn't i think there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to mental health and i think um it's it's nice to be able to write something and say this might not seem real to you because you've not experienced it, but this was real for me when I wrote it and, and everything I put into those stories are true. I never had to make something up for them necessarily. I put them into a fictionalised um, setting because it is. But everything that happens in there is... is, is uh, everything that... I think if we talk about creases for specifically, because mm. I get confused trying to mix them all together. But mm. if you talk about creases, for instance, you don't everything that happens to that main character is something that I experience personally. Everything that people say to that main character is something that I experience personally. Mm. The battle that the, that main character has with their voice of hate is uh, very real battles that I've had many times personally with my own voice of hate. So, you know, it, it's very real in that aspect and very real in that sense. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it's difficult to sort of to gauge where that, that line is as, as between what's fact and what's fiction, you know. Mm. I saw some people on Goodreads um, labelled um, creases as autobiographical um, and some people labelled it as non-fiction. Um, and I would, you know, I'm not going to correct other people because I think when it comes to that sort of thing, it's up to others to decide what's real and what's not for them. But mm. when I wrote it... Um, I didn't write it as a non-fiction piece um, and I didn't write it totally autobiographical. Um, I wrote it as a fictional piece. But, um, yeah. It sounds exhausting. It is exhausting. And I think that's one of the big things that um, people misunderstand. I think particularly about depression. My personal um, diagnosis is PTSD with comorbid depression and OCD. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, sometimes people hear things like that and they just think, oh, well, you think you've got everything. But mental health often does come along with other things. It's, they call it comorbidity. And, you know, it comes along with, if you've got PTSD, you're likely to have depression as well. And if you've got depression, then you have a higher chance of, of developing OCD. And, you know, if you, if you have those, then you're likely to develop other anxiety disorders and such. So people do often end up with two or three different mental health illnesses all at one time happening all at once. And again, I don't really want to talk for other people because I think everyone experiences it differently. Mm -hmm. But in my experience, you know, it, it's, it has been relentless. Um, you never get away from it. Um, you never have any break from it. So you've got to try and find ways to live with it. And uh, you know, sometimes that's easier than other times. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you, you have good days where you feel like the good days are not good days because it wasn't there, but the good days were good days because you just managed it that day. Um, but it doesn't mean you're going to manage it tomorrow, and it doesn't mean you know you managed it the day before. Um, yeah, it, it is exhausting. It, it, it's relentless. Um, and I think that's why some people end up in a really bad situation with their mental health because um, you know you can fight for so long or you can fight saying oh well I'm getting through or I'm surviving here and then it can be one tiny little thing that is just uh, that just tips you over the edge really and then it all comes crumbling down you lose everything and you know it suddenly becomes a very big thing again um, and I think it's easy for people on the outside to go oh well he seemed like he was doing so well or you know mm. oh well he seemed to be better um, and, and of course, some people do get better from their mental health, but for some people, it is a lifelong condition and they're not going to get better from it. They're just going to manage it for certain times and, and not manage it other times. Mm. Um, and so I, I think increases part of what I wanted to explore there. Well, there was a couple of things that, that I wanted to say in that story, but one of the things I wanted to show was 
was just how relentless it is and how exhausting it is and how and from everyday tiny little things like brushing your teeth in the morning if it's a bad mental health day that can be a huge task and not not just because you haven't got the physical energy to go and do it that is part of it but also because the head can become so fuzzy and so messy that you forget how to brush your teeth <laughs> and, um, you know you stand at, at, at the bathroom mirror sort of looking at the toothbrush and the toothpaste knowing that you've got to do something with it but can't quite figure out what it is you've got to do with it um and, and then if you're living with with ocd as i am and as the character increases is uh, then that voice of hair takes over in that moment and um you know it just becomes uh, sort of one bad thing after another after another that can lead people to to full-on crisis points it's a real tricky one isn't it i think um it, it's a tricky one because to speak about it and to talk about it i'm relatively okay and comfortable with talking about it but i recognize that it's a heavy subject for other people so i, I tend to become uncomfortable with the idea that i'm making other people uncomfortable by talking about it i'm not saying that's what's happening here but you know just in general i know i i know exactly what you mean but i think that and and i think that's a very real perception but i think that it's not it's something that i guess I want to fight against with these kind of chats for one mm. it's it's not it's not it's the kind of um I want to create the space to have chats about anything I like I've never I noticed I've never actually uh defined what the mission of this podcast was and I thought it was kind of apparent or rather I kind of learned what it was as I was doing it but if I was to sum it up it's something like uh an artist interests me because I like their work and then I believe that because I like their work, I will like that person. Um, and if that's true, then we can have an open conversation because I imagine that there's something about them that's open and compelling that they that we can talk about. Um, yeah. 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 I, I, absolutely. I think you've got that. Um, yeah. Maybe you haven't defined it as as succinct as that, but I think. Uh, that is very much the feel of the podcast. Mm. As you are aware, uh, I am a listener to the podcast. Yeah. Um, and um, I think that that's part of why I enjoy it as a listener. Um, mm. You know, is that you can listen to one person and one minute they're cracking silly jokes or you're talking about the way that they write or, or you know, people are talking about their journey as, as a creative individual. Um, but then you can also have those real deep conversations where you talk about, you know, life and depression and death and existing and struggles and battles mm -hmm. um i think that, that in one respect part of me says well those are the conversations that we absolutely should be having just to stand it anyway we mm -hmm. have to normalize those discussions we have to make them a part of everyday life yeah but then i think on the other hand you know it, it is somewhat of a brave thing to do because um people don't want to talk about it on the whole um I think I found certain people that do want to talk about it and, and want to talk about it a bit too much sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've met people in the past where every time I meet with them, I can just see that in their eyes, they're thinking, oh, this is, this is CJ. And he's depressed, 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 de depression, depression, mental health, mental health. And they can't seem to get past that and see everything else that I am as well as that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but then, you know, I have met some other people where, you know, I might casually drop into conversation that, you know, yesterday was a bad mental health day or whatever, and you, you just see the reaction to them and you think they're just not in a place where they're ready to have those open conversations and have those discussions. Um, mm -hmm. And you're never quite sure why that is. You know, people are on their own journeys and, and you know, it might be a bit too personal for them. It might just be something that, that's been drummed into them that you don't talk about that sort of stuff, you know, typical sort of stiff upper lip sort of mentality that is rummed into some people um but yeah i think it's important to have the discussions and i think i think the difficulty is, is there's so much shame attached to being different in any way when whether we're talking about mental health or whether we're talking about certain sort of character traits or whatever it is there's so much shame attached to if you're not the normal then you're different and being different is shameful and i think um particularly when it comes to mental health, some people are pretending that it, it's not a normal part of life, but it is a normal part of life for everybody. You know, we all have mental health. Um, some of it is positive, some of it's negative. 
some people will go through periods of having negative mental health. Some people will live permanently with negative mental health. Mm. Um, and I think I think we do have to normalise those discussions. We have to make them a normal part of, of what we talk about without them feeling like, oh, shit, I've got moved down or, oh, shit, I've, you know, what happens if this person is uncomfortable with this or, oh, shit, how do we move on from that or, you know, or anything really, or, mm. you know. Must I always be sensible around this person now, or must I be sensitive as to what I say, or careful to what I say? Because what if they take it the wrong way? And you know, there's so many subtleties really that people are trying to 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 sort of battle with their own mind as to what they're comfortable with. That I think sometimes people just end up just not talking about it full stop. I think that's more dangerous than talking about it. Absolutely, um, and I think. Yeah, we we have to discuss it, and for us creative types, we have to write stories about it, and we have to yeah yeah put it out there, and we have to tell people you know it's not all rainbows and butterflies, but you know this is a a, a very real part of life, and, and I I almost said as a writer, oh gosh, I didn't write. <laughs> You're a writer. <laughs> You're a writer. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Um, as a developing writer. <laughs> I feel that it's important that I talk about life. Because um, isn't that really what we're all doing with stories? Isn't that the whole purpose of stories? Is it just about us trying to um, sort of make sense of, of, of what's around it? Oh, gosh, I'm sounding incredibly pretentious now. But I think there is an aspect of that, you know, that we like stories because it either gives us an escape from our reality or it helps us make sense of our reality. Hmm. I think yeah, I think that's true. Uh, I mean, I think that the the reasons why we write are depending on you know the resolution at which you look at it is it, it is going to be as different as the, the many different people that do write. Um, I mean, I like my own my own way of looking at. It. I, I think like the the way to get good. I mean, if anyone if anyone listening wants ever to be as good as me as a writer, well, first of all, like, take note, guys. <laughs> take note. Um, I, I think the way to, to improve as a writer, at least, is to gradually create your own perception of what it is you're doing in terms of, like, the the process that you do and the what you think your goal is with it. So if, if I was talking about my own, I think of stories as... Uh, like a system of words that generates meaning. That's my that's how it works for me. So what's the most meaningful thing I can put on the page? Uh it's a mixture of like what I already know and what I want to learn. Um that I think about something. <laughs> I'm obviously I'm obviously a lot more articulate on the page. <laughs> we are. <laughs> that's because we've written it fifteen times before anyone. Yeah. Is it? Um, is it a sense of you have an idea of what it is you you've made sense of something and you feel like maybe others need help to make sense of it therefore you write it down or do you go in thinking you don't know what it is and you haven't made sense of it and writing a particular story is going to help you make sense of it in your own mind yeah i think that i think it starts off as the former and then becomes the like the latter like i think if you yeah. i think if you start off like it, if I come up with a a story idea, like typically I'll start with something that's just like a principle. Like what, what if this happened to somebody one day? And the reason I've set this up is because I want to have this message. That's like, that's what the form is typically, but by the end of it, it has to be more, it has to have become more complex than that. It has to like, if I, if I am creating a story with a, with a, something that's happening to someone in order to express what I think, I need to develop it enough so that the opposite of what I think is in the story and that what I think okay. is is not clear by the end because it's it's not about what I think it's about it's about the complexity of the issue itself so I think that yeah yeah I think uh, um, some of my favorite stories are stories that don't give you a complete answer to something um, and and I think I've written certain stories where I have come to a complete answer I think um, creases to some dis some well maybe it does have concrete finish maybe it doesn't um, but I think sometimes it's about I found that in the process of writing a story I've been able to answer my own questions as 
to what it is I'm trying to explore, what it is I'm trying to make sense of. And I feel like I've got a better understanding of something. Sometimes not a complete understanding, but I've got a better understanding. Mm-hmm. And then I battle with that that idea of now I must preach this to the world. <laughs> that mm-hmm. idea that, all right, well, I've got this enlightenment that I must share with everyone else. Um, because I think the, the reason why I battle with it is, is because I think the realisation and the understanding of whatever it is I was trying to explore um, is very personal to me and my understanding of the situation might be different to someone else's understanding to a situation. And I don't necessarily want to say this is the right way to think about these things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I sort of often think, well, this is the right way for me to think about these things because that's what works for me. But let's, you know, if someone else thinks differently to it, then so be it. Um, and I think sometimes, in, I think as, a, as I've written more stories as I've gone along, I do feel like I've got a little bit better at writing stories where I'm not preaching to people and I'm not um, saying, well, this is the way things should be. Instead, I've left it a bit more open-ended as to... Um, I think there's a real skill in, in, in writing a story where you say what happens, but you don't really necessarily have to explain why it happens. I think you can leave that for the reader to to determine for them, for themselves, really. Yeah, like, if... If we're talking about creases, it's like a slice of life. It's like a day in the life of someone. So I and I think the same is true of the applicant as well. Like it's a character study, um, but it's not like you're pronounce. It's it's, a, it's like a non judgmental character study. It's not like you're pronouncing on why these people are the way that they are. Um, so I I mean I think you're doing a great job of that. But I it's um yeah like thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I think if I think about the story um, in Perpetuum, which I think is the final story in Unsound Sounds, I yes. should probably know this, shouldn't have been the person who wrote <laughs> it, but um, <laughs> in Perpetuum, um, I quite like in Perpetuum because it, it achieved what I set out to do. Um, whether other people like it or not, again, you know, it, it's sort of up to them, um, really. Um, but I think for me, I wanted to say these things are happening. Um, but, but there's a lot of, um, oh, wow, I was about to say there's a lot of subtlety to that story, but it sounds like I'm bragging about my own stories. I mustn't do that. But I think uh, I tried to put a lot of uh, subtlety into there, and I, I'm hoping that I achieve that in that those characters, I think both those characters, in perpetuum, for those who haven't read it, it is um, it, it's two characters, um, a young girl and then a guy. And I think, both characters don't necessarily do what we would expect them to do in those situations. Um, but I wanted it to be more than just, oh, these characters aren't doing what we expect them to do because, oh, then look how quirky and fun and look how I've uh, you know, taken the reader away from their expectations. That wasn't the end of it. Because I think if you look into a bit more as to their motivations as to why they're doing what they're doing, they do exactly what you would expect them to do in that situation. It's just that it doesn't necessarily fit in with um you know what you might see on the surface or what you might expect on the surface um so i've got a little bit of feedback on on, on things like in perpetuum where people have interpreted it very different to my interpretation as i was writing it Mm. and i like that i enjoy that you know certain people have read it and said oh this is what i took from it or this is what i got from it the same with creases really you know certain things seem to have stood out with, with people that i felt was a an insignificant little bit of the story. Well, not insignificant, otherwise it wouldn't be there. But, you know, a small part of the story. Mm. And that's, that's made a big impact on them. Whereas the things that I felt would make a bigger impact haven't made a big impact on them. And I love that. I, I, I mm-hmm. think that's fantastic. I, I love that as a reader, and I'm enjoying that as a writer. Um, is that, you know, we can do that with stories. and We can, you know, we can have five people read a story, and that story can mean five different things to to those people um i i enjoy that it sounds like uh feedback is really important to you um, in, in one respect um well i like getting feedback once i feel like i've ended a story i think one thing i'm not very good at as a writer and this isn't self-deprecation it's just trying to recognize areas that i need to improve in but i think one thing i'm not very good at is getting feedback whilst i'm writing a story hmm. um I don't send my story to people to read. I don't give it to anybody else. 
Um, the, the moment that the first person reads a story written is the moment that I've published it, or has been in the past, I'm trying to change that. <laughs> it's not so much that it, it's important to develop the story, because um, writing is a very personal thing for me. I'm writing the stories for myself before I'm writing them for anyone else. Um, and so by the time I've published them, I normally publish them because, and when I say published, it's normally just published on the blog. Um, that I, I publish them there because I just think I've finished with that story because I've said what I wanted to say and I've, I've explored the area that I wanted to explore. Then when people do come back and give me feedback, and I make it sound like, you know, they're queuing up for miles to give me feedback, it's literally two or three people. <laughs> <laughs> but they, when they do come back and give me feedback, it's always interesting to me. Hmm. It's a, you know, there's a genuine uh, sort of fascination for me about what is it that that person's taken from the story, whether they like the story or not. People say they like the story, and you know, there might be an aspect that they did enjoy the stories. There might be an aspect of them just being polite about that. Um, but whether someone enjoyed the story or not is not so much important to me. What, what interests me is about what message did they receive from that story. Hmm. And you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with the idea that the message they've received from that story might be very different to the message I set out to try and tell. Um, because you know, stories and, and enjoyment of stories and messages and stories are, are so subjective. So, yeah, I, th- I, I think the subjectivity comes from a good story. If there, if there's enough material there for somebody to take something different from it, then it's obviously good. Um, I think if you manage to engage somebody in a story, you're always going to get subjectivity. I think the the big problem is, is when people walk away from a story and feel like they just weren't able to engage with it and weren't able to relate to it in any aspect whatsoever. And that's when you tend to get people, you know, who either write reviews or, or just give you feedback around, you know, yeah, it was a good story and this happened in it. Mm-hmm. Um, as, a, as a former book blogger, I, um, <laughs> I read many, many reviews for many different stories. Uh, and the ones that always interested me were whether or not interested me. Well, yeah, I suppose interested me in, in one respect as to why they're doing it. But because essentially they just rewrite the synopsis of the story. And it's like this happened, then this happened, then this happened. It's a really good book, please read it. <laughs> um, and I just I, I read those sort of reviews where I think, well, that's not necessarily a review. Um, but but did that person really engage with that story? Did they really engage with actually what... Those are things that happened in the story, but is that what the story is actually saying? Is that what the book is setting out to say? Um, and I often feel like when I read those sort of reviews, I just think, well, they haven't engaged with the story. Um, or not that they haven't engaged with it. The story hasn't engaged with them. It's a two-way street. Um, hmm. So, yeah, so that, that, those ones interest me. Yeah, no, I, I I agree. I think that um, if you if something really worked for you, then you should you at least for me, if I'm ever reviewing something, I always have a lot to say about it. Um, and I really like. I, I think that if a review isn't personal, I don't know why somebody is writing it. If you're writing a review that somebody else could have written, then you're I don't know. Especially if no one's asking you to do it, like you would want to do something that is yours. Yeah. It, it, it's really interesting, isn't it? I think um, coming from being a book blogger and then having the, the book blog that I had for, um, I can't remember how long it was like, for, but I had it there for a year or two. Um, I think there are some people who are just reading stories because um, it's what they do, and then you end up with a depersonalised review. Um, I always try to to be somewhat personal in my reviews, um, and I would try and put a little bit of my character in there and be a bit silly with it, but also connect it to personal stories when they needed to connect with personal stories. But what was really interesting is I found that those were the ones that didn't get as much engagement, they didn't get as many likes or comments or whatever it was. And mm. As much as um, I was never overly concerned about statistics and numbers and stuff like that, but it was always interesting to me to see that the reviews... I'm using air quotes, reviews, you can't see it, but I am doing, believe me, they're there. Um, <laughs> the reviews where I just wrote, because I did fall into the trap myself of just writing 
it's like rewriting a synopsis sometimes. Um, those ones seem to get much more engagement than sometimes the stories where I rambled for you know 300 words about a personal story or a personal connection with a story. But I bet you had more fun writing about yourself. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's all about me. That's that's my that's my most interesting subject to talk about. <laughs> What happened with the blog? Why is it over? Um, a number of reasons, really. Um, it just it stopped being fun, really. Um, I think I set up Random Melon Reads because um, I found that I had things to say about certain books that I was reading. Um, I fell out of reading for a long time throughout my teens, and then I sort of fell back into reading in my in my twenties. Um, and I found that I was reading all these stories and had wonderful things that I wanted to say about these stories. Um, I'm somewhat of a, hmm, I was going to say a mourner, that makes it sound very sad. I'm not sad about it, but I am somewhat of, a, of a, an individual who lives an individual life very much. Um, so I don't have lots of friends that I can go and talk to about stories and the books that I was reading and stuff like that. So. The occasional time when I did read a really good book and I wanted to scream from the rafters about how great it was, I found that I was just sort of looking around thinking, there is nobody I can scream to about this. Mm. Um, and so I joined Goodreads um, and started using Goodreads and then I connected with a number of, of book bloggers on Goodreads um, and found that, oh yeah, I can scream about how good this book is to this person because they they get it, they understand literature and, and, the, and the joys of books. Um, and so from there, sort of the, the blog came about um, almost in an organic way, really. You know, I, I had good reads and I, I joined, I rejoined Twitter. I quit Twitter for a number of years and then I rejoined Twitter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and people were just like, oh, have you got a book blog I can follow? Have you got a blog I can go to and read? And for a long time, I was just like, no, nah, it's not really my sort of thing. You know, I'm happy just writing a review on good reads and copying it over to Amazon or whatever. Um, and then after a while, I thought, well, go on then, I'll, I'll do a book blog. So, um, so I did, I created it. I had a lot of fun with it to start with. Um, but then after a while, it just, it's one of those things, sort of book blogging, where, um, and I feel it's, it's probably the same with, with any sort of online community. I did used to be a big part of a, a big gaming community in the past and things like that. So I feel like, there's so many clicks to it and there's so many different parts to it and there's so many, um, sort of, again, social expectations. Of, if you're a book blogger, then it means you do these things. It means that you log on to NetGalley and you, you ask for 20,000 books that you're not going to read. It means you, you, know, you go to this thing and you have this schedule and you tag all these people into these tag posts and so on and so forth. And that just didn't really fit with me. I just wanted to read a book and then if I had something to say, have somewhere to go and say it, whatever it was I had to say. Um, and what I found is that I, I couldn't, I got to the point where I couldn't read a story without thinking about what I was going to write in the review. Mm. Uh, um, and I was so desperately at the time trying to stay away from just rewriting the synopsis of the story that I felt like, well, I have to say something um, intellectual. I have to say something intelligent about this story, other than yeah, it was good to make read it, <laughs> which is often what my thoughts were at the end. Of the day. <laughs> yeah, you enjoyed that. You should read it. You might like it too. Um, but there's only a certain amount of times you can say that in a review before you end up just saying the same thing over and over again. Mm. <laughs> and so I would end up having a, sort of a draft document that I would have open as I was reading a story. So that as I came to bits that I liked, I could say, oh, yeah, I like how the author did this or, you know, how they explored this or how this character did this thing that sort of set up whatever is happening and so on and so forth. But it just, I think really it clicked for me one day that I wasn't enjoying it as much as I was when I was sat in a coffee shop and I got out my Kindle and went to read a chapter of a story and thought, oh, no, I can't read it right now because I haven't got my draft document to write into and I just sat there thinking, well, this this isn't what reading should be. <laughs> this, mm. you know, I should be able to just whip out my Kindle at any point. Mm. So just take that quote in, in isolation. <laughs> <laughs> it was 
whip out my Kindle at any point and enjoy the chapter of the story um, without constantly thinking about, or oh, what is it the author is trying to do here, or trying to deconstruct the story. Yeah. Um, and so I just got to the point where it was, um, the blog never really took off, and I'm, I'm fine with that, you know, that I'm not bitter about that in any way. I recognise why it didn't take off, because I wasn't working with all these publishers, and I wasn't going for them to release books and shit like that, you know. I was the guy in the background saying, hey, have you read this little indie graphic novel that nobody's read? Because uh, it's really good, and you should read it. <laughs> but that doesn't get that doesn't get hits, that doesn't get likes, it doesn't get people coming to your blog. Um, so I never got a lot of um, statistics coming in, and, and therefore I just thought, I'm putting a lot of effort into this. It's it's sapping the fun of reading mm-hmm. from me um, for very little in return. Um, and so, yeah, I just decided it was time to let the blog go. Um, and I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did, because um, I've been able to read much more I, f- I find I read more now that I don't have a book walk, ironically, because I just feel <laughs> more free to read. I can read at any moment, at any time. And if I get to the end of a story and I've only got two things to say about it, then I can just do a two-line review on Goodreads and give it a rating. And, um, mm-hmm. and on Amazon, copy and put to Amazon to please the authors. <laughs> and then, you know, move on to the next book and not have to think about, oh, gosh, now I have to write this 1,500-word review or, you know. And try and be funny and comical in there as well, mm. you know. So yeah, it, it it just I think the quick answer to that is it just became a bit too much of a chore, and, mm. and therefore I didn't enjoy it anymore. I imagine still that the listeners to this podcast are mostly writers themselves, and I defy any writer not to say that they felt like that about writing, like a mm. lot. I mean, especially if you're, uh, I mean. I'm going to say supposed to connect to social media. I don't know what you're supposed to do. Like, this is, I thought this was a thing that we decided we were going to do individually. You're not supposed to do anything, but it's, I I think it's because there's something about it. I, I, you know, first of all, you, you kind of have to ignore how many people are doing it in order to enjoy doing it. But if you do, you know, remind yourself of how many people are doing it, then you feel the need to assert your authority as to why you're doing it. Now, everyone has the right to write things. They have the right to type a sentence. You don't have to be a guy or like a thing to do it. And I mean, and then, God, I don't know, because, yeah, it's very relatable. You're absolutely right. Um, But I think that is such a difficult message to keep in your mind when you, when you're in there. Oh, it's impossible, impossible. And and the thing yeah. is, like, it, it, once it gets in your head, you start to think that you you must definitely not be one of the people who is allowed to do this because they don't get distracted by this message. But you're you're only human. That's just how it works. Like absolutely, yeah. I found that you know, particularly with the not so much with the writing, but but with the book blogging, it just felt like. I would write a review and then sometimes I'd get to the end and I'd just think, what what is my, you know, USP with this? What, why are people coming to me to look at my review for this? Um, and then I found, well, then it must be because, you know, I can crack these silly little ridiculous dad jokes throughout or I can <laughs> say these silly little things and people will, will sort of roll their eyes and, and laugh ironically at me. Um and then it almost became a bit of, well, that is who I am, and that is what the the, the whole site is supposed to be about, you know. And sometimes that was difficult because I was reading stories that were dealing with heavy subjects sometimes, <laughs> and it's difficult to write a silly review about, a, a, you know, a review full of hyperbole and, and silliness when, it, um, you know, when you're dealing with, with very sensitive subjects. Um, but then sometimes I just thought, well, you know, I'm just not in that mood. I'm not in the mood to be the silly, showy, offy guy. So then I'd write a review and then I'd post it and think, oh, shit, no, that's not, it's not good enough. It's not to my standards, really. I wasn't really bothered about other people's standards necessarily, but it wasn't to my standards. Mm. Um, and then you, I'd find, just fall into this this pit of despair with it, really, where it's just, well, I'm not achieving what what I'm supposed to achieve with it. And then you do end up with those those thoughts that you were saying just then about, you know, that, that I don't deserve to do this or I don't yeah. belong to be doing this because everyone else seems to be doing it and seems to be doing it so easily. Hmm. And as much as you can tell yourself logically that, 
Um, well, no, they're having the same doubts that I'm having. They wrote that review five times before they published it, or they wrote that short story 20 times before they published it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a logical sense. And often it's it's not a logical argument that you're battling with. It, it's a feeling, it's an emotion. So you can tell yourself as much as you like that, well, that's not the reality. But if you're not feeling that, mm. and you're not getting rid of, of that insecurity and that anxiety there, um, and so for me, uh, I just, yeah, it was that that made the decision for me that, well, you know, I, I was done with the blog. Um, mm. yeah. And I don't, look, I don't look at it bitterly. I think there's this sense of, you know, if you quit blogging, it must be because you've fallen into a very bitter, angry place with it and that you look back on it as a negative thing. And mm -hmm. I absolutely don't. But I think I, I quit blogging or book blogging um, at the right time, really. I was fortunate in that I recognised that it was starting to become unpleasant or it was starting... It wasn't really unpleasant either. It, it was starting to lack the enjoyment that it used to have. Um, and I think I got out at the right time. Really. I, you know, I was just like, right, I'm done with it. I don't have to do this. Mm. I'm not, you know, it's, it's not like nobody's paying me for it. Absolutely not. It costs me money, this. You know, I don't make money <laughs> from it. <laughs> and therefore, if I don't want to do it, then... And I don't have to do it. Um, and I haven't, I've never felt that with writing. I recognise that some mm. people do feel that with writing. I'm still very early in my writing um, journey, mm -hmm. although I hate that term. But you know, I'm very uh, early in that writing journey. Maybe I will get to the point where I feel like it's not enjoyable anymore. And I think, well, then I'll stop for a while, you know, and I'll come back to it when I do have that burning need to do it again. Yeah, that's a... Random Deeds isn't live right now, but I don't know whether it will be in six months' time or 12 months' time or whether it will be, you know, two years or whatever. There might be a time when I decide, well, the last five books I've read, I've, I've got something to say about each one of them, and then I'll pop the, the site live again. Um, yeah. You know, there's, there's no rules with it. I think that's the big thing is you fall into it and you start almost self-defining that, well, I'm a book blogger or I'm a writer or I'm an actor, or, you know, I'm a, I'm a video game streamer, or whatever it is, and you think, well, that, that's who I am, so I must go and do this now. Mm -hmm. I think you don't. You don't have to do it if you're not enjoying it. <laughs> um, yeah. Some people have to do it, obviously. If you're making money from it, or if not doing it is going to cause you more harm than doing it, then sure, carry on with it. But I think for a lot of us, you know, you don't want to do it, then just don't do it. And, and that doesn't mean that you've decided that, you can never be that again. <laughs> I can go back to being a book lover. If I stop <laughs> writing for whatever time, I can decide to go back to being a writer again. You know, I could, I, I, like I said, I, I used to be part of a big online video gaming community. I decided to stop being a, a Twitch streamer for a while. I haven't gone back to it, but it doesn't mean I never will do. And it doesn't mean I can't go back to it if I wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's that uh, mythological notion of the real Twitch streamer, the real blogger. It's just it's just somebody doing it. Like it's somebody who has a blog is a blogger. Somebody who writes something is a writer. Um, I think we, you know, it's. I mean, I I know there are other writing podcasts. I know there are other, uh, writers who blog about stuff, and just all the time they're talking about like. Was it always Stephen King? It's just always Stephen King. They're just all yammering about Stephen King all the time, and it's like, mate, but you realize that you're valuable now. You, you know, like you. Okay, you made a podcast episode, hooray! You know, like let's celebrate that. But like, I, I, I hey, if you want to be the next Stephen King, I hope you are him. I really do. But let's Absolutely. like celebrate along the way, please. Like, don't don't decide you're only going to be happy once you achieve. I don't know, the most success a writer has ever achieved in the history of writing, because you're definitely not going to make it if that's your if that's your emotional plan for the future, you know? Absolutely not. I think um, I think most people do get that. I think most people do recognise that. You know, for every Stephen King, there are literally tens of thousands of people who mm. are not Stephen King and are trying to be Stephen King. Yep. Um, and then for every one of those there are thousands of people who are happy being indie authors and indie writers or just happy writing for themselves or whatever. Mm. Um, and I, I think, yeah, if you go in there thinking, well, I want to be a big shot writer, 
maybe that works for them, but that that would never work for me. Um, that's not why I write, and it's not why I read. Um, you know, I think to some degree I would probably end up sabotaging that situation if I ever came up because I'm not sure if that's what I ever really want. Um, yeah. No, I, I totally relate to that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a real shame. Like I, like again, like this, and and like if if you if you have a podcast like like this, and I choose who I'm going to interview, they have to be people who are interesting to me specifically. It may be because I like you know if it may be because I like the writing, maybe because they are uh, published by very prestigious outlets. It may be because they're winning awards it might be it's probably not the most compelling thing to me personally especially if it's something so big it's compelling to lots of different people and that probably means that I won't come out with something unique in the end because if somebody um you know when people come to me if they are very very big they've lined up 10 other interviews that week and yeah they're it, it takes it takes some um, if you're an introvert like I am, and I'm, I'm presuming you are as well. Like it takes energy to have an authentic conversation, and if, if you're going to have ten of them in a week, you want to be on autopilot, really, to preserve your energy for other things. So if you see that with um, when you look at writers or or any sort of you know people who are big in in the mainstream, they just end up having the same interview over and over and over again with people. Mm. <laughs> And I've done that with, you know, I've watched certain interviewers where I've watched them, watched them on panels, and um, I think, oh, I really like this writer, I really like what they wrote here. So I'll go and watch a bunch of YouTube videos on them. And then I sort of get into the fifth or sixth interview where I think, oh, God, you're just saying the same thing you said in the last four <laughs> interviews. <laughs> and some of that I get a bit uh, self-entitled to feel like I, I deserve something different. But then I do have that mindset of, you know, well, actually, this is probably the 15th time they've been asked that question or, you know, yeah. the 10th the time that they've had to go out and sell this message that they're supposed to sell. I, I think, uh, yeah, you lose the authenticity of it. You lose that, that message of who they are as a person. Um, I think that's why there's an aspect of um, I'm resistant to the mainstream in that sense of, you know, would, would, God, I am sounding like a hipster now, but, uh, but I am resistant to the mainstream because I just feel like so much of it is has been polished and, and presented in a certain way that you just lose the reality of the situation. Where you know, if you listen to podcasts like this, or, or you watch, um, or if you read interviews that people are writing on their own blogs, you know, indie writers and, and authors, that there's a sense of you get a little bit more of who they are as a real person. Rather than just I'm here to plug this book or I'm here to plug this movie or to plug this story or to to sell, um, and, and and I'm not criticizing that. I'm not saying there, there isn't a place for that because there is a place for that. Um, but that doesn't align with my own personal wishes and wants and feelings towards um, writing and stories. And, you know, mm. I can't remember the last time I re I read a. A, st a book that was published by one of the big publishing houses um, because I just they don't appeal to me. They don't. Um, I've got to the point where you know there are so many indie authors that I want to read at the moment. There's so many indie indie books out there, partly because of this podcast. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but look at my recent um, Kindle buys or look at my recent Goodreads want to read list. It, it's just full of um, sort of indie people um, because I feel like you might. I think there's there's a higher chance that I'll get more of an authentic story from that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, it's difficult to to judge fully because obviously, you know, I've not been on the other end of of, of that. Um, you know, I've not been there being. I've never been published by anyone, regardless of whether they're a big publisher or whether they're an indie publisher. Um, and so I don't know what it's like to to have to represent or feel that um, duty to represent the the publisher as well. You know, it's not. I think it, it almost feels to me as though it would be almost like, well, I don't just have to sell this book for myself now. I have to sell it for the publisher. Yeah. Um, and and you know. Right now, I'm not saying it never will be in the future because I don't want to burn any bridges. But, um, mm. right, yeah. 
that uh, that isn't my goal. And that isn't my desire is to, to sell all these books. I have to. I think I recently put Untown Sounds up on um, on Amazon. I wanted to get it onto Amazon because people were saying, well, how do I get your book? And I said, well, you've got to smash words and you download it from there or you go on the core ball and buy box and it's all free there. But people really, you know, not everyone, but most people want to go to Amazon and just download it to the Kindle. Mm. Um, so I had to put it onto Amazon and then I had to put it up for sale. And I'm deeply uncomfortable with the idea of selling the book. So I put it up for as little as I possibly could. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that I'm not, you know, the, the reason why I'm deeply uncomfortable with selling it is because that was never my goal. That wasn't what I was trying to do. And mm. um, I've got nothing against people who do sell the books. You know, it's, uh, it sounds like I'm shitting on those people. And I'm absolutely not. People want to sell the books and earn a living from it and go for it. Um, but that was never my goal. It was never my goal to, to sell a story. My, my goal was to write a story. And then if people want to read it, great. And if they don't, then they don't. You know, each to their own. Mm. Uh, so I've um, I've gone through all my questions. Um, if you've got if you've got any jokes you didn't use, I think now is an excellent time for another one. All right, let me have a look. <laughs> let me see what the best joke on... I mean, the best joke coming off the top of my head. <laughs> written down so I bought an antique pencil oh shit no I've already told <laughs> let's have a look um, uh, this is definitely a good way to, to tell a joke um, so uh, someone broke into my house the other week Leo oh no it? oh it was terrible they broke into my house and the only thing they stole was uh, my limbo stick just, just how low can you get? Uh, <laughs> yeah, there it is. There's, oh, look at that laughter. <laughs> oh God. Um, it's it's been an absolute delight. Um, do you have do you have anything that we didn't talk about? No, I don't think so. Yeah, it's it's been a pleasure to to be on the show and to chat with you. Mm. Uh, as I said, you, you know that I'm. A big fan of the podcast. I've listened to every episode um, and I thoroughly enjoyed listening to the podcast um, as a whole. Oh, um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure to come on and to chat with you. I'm I, I really appreciate it. I'm so glad that you that you're enjoying the podcast and that that you've listened to it all. I really appreciate it because it's um it's uh I mean as you know having done your blog these are like very you know time consuming passion projects. So it's nice to know that somebody is out there appreciating it. <laughs> so there you go. That was Jack C.J. Stark. His short story collection is Unsound Sounds. It's out now from Smashwords. Link in the description. Um, if you're a reader, writer, editor, uh, listener with something to say uh, if you for whatever reason you might want to get in touch with me you can do so using losing the plot podcast at gmail.com please let me know how I did how you're enjoying this new format uh, who you want me to interview whatever the hell it is please do get in touch I always look forward to hearing from you once again Ephotic Realm issue 7 uh, gruesome is the theme it's open for submissions uh, as of recording you uh, can find out details on the website and please do consider picking up the latest issue which is number six the theme is fangs uh, eight brand new stories 64 color pages interview with adam neville don't miss it thank you so much for listening and uh, you'll hear more from me later but that's all from me for now so bye bye